Good morning, everyone. Welcome to La Cunada Congregational Church. This week, we began a new series exploring through the chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, which examines the resurrection of Christ and what it means for us, how we can find hope in that resurrection. And so I hope that as we move into this service, you are able to sense how God comes to save us and not just save us, but then set us on a mission that would see the love of God and the peace of God reach all. The psalmist calls us to that mission saying, on the day I called you, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. The Lord will fulfill God's purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And so we are created by God to come to this time and worship so that we might be filled with the energy of God to see God's love spread. And so I invite you to worship with us. I invite you to pray with me this prayer of confession. Oh God, we find our purpose made new in the life found in you. New strength, new love, new hope. This day we pray for a revival of our souls. Establish us as a people who love God and love one another. In the name of Christ, amen. And we are firmly established on God's promises so that when we come to God in prayer, we can know that God will listen and respond. And so I invite you to take your concerns as well as the concerns of those that have been entrusted into your care and bring them before God this morning.
And together with many others who have gathered, let us pray this prayer that the Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Lately, I've been spending a few mornings every week uh, hiking the Cherry Canyon trails around the house and the church here. And Erica always asks whenever I get back, did I have a good hike? And I have to kind of pause and think of myself, did, did I have a good hike as in, did I enjoy myself for the hour and a half I was there hiking? No. Did I have a good hike in the sense of I didn't die in the middle of nowhere or sprain my ankle as I was making my way down? Well, sure, I guess that was a good hack. It's the same thing I have whenever I ask the kids if they had a good day at school. I can see them thinking, well, what's the maximum good you can have at school? And so if good means not bad, then sure. But most of our experiences in the mundane parts of life, did you have a good day? Well, it's good, but it more is like fine. We're, we're really not used to something good happening, especially when it's, you know, work, exercise, or, or being at school. But in the scriptures, we find the story of the good news. And it is something that has become so central to the faith, especially in the early church, that it really shapes everything that they come to understand about their life and their spiritual community together. And so I want us to spend the next uh, several weeks examining what this good news is, particularly as it relates to the resurrection. Paul's going to give us some shape of what that looks like in 1 Corinthians 15. And, and so what I want us to do as we look at this, I want us to imagine of how can this good news be something that's more than just fine or not bad, but in fact, something that can transform how we go about living life in this world. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. So before we get started, I want us to acknowledge that there is often a lack of good in the world. And especially as we see the outspoken Christians in our media, we can really feel that there's not a lot of good news they have to share. In fact, there's one uh, media Christian celebrity that I've heard that, that recently uh, highlights on her program uh, a reason to celebrate when those who have advocated for getting the COVID-19 vaccine turn up to have COVID-19. Uh, it proves her point. She wins some political points while abandoning this Christian call to care for the sick and instead celebrates the fact that they got sick. See, it doesn't work. Uh, I'm sure you have your own stories of those frustrating moments when you would see people who proclaim to be Christians in a very public way, really undermining what the whole message is about. And I guess it's some consolation to consider, well, it's not the first time in church history that Christians have not behaved in the way that really embodies the message that they would preach. In fact, most of the New Testament is addressing the misshapen understanding of the gospel with how it's being lived out in these church communities. And by all standards, Corinth especially was a mess, fractured and broken up. And in fact, in this letter alone that Paul is writing to try to deal with a lot of these issues within the Corinthian church, we've gotten through 14 chapters or so where Paul has dealt with division and backbiting, anger and arguments about food and spouses and prayer and the wider culture. It seems that this church is 
is crumbling from within and just unable to really get a hold on what they're trying to do. And, and Paul says that the way that they're going to find their way forward is that they have to realize that they have up to this point seemed to miss the road entirely. And so he wants to get them back to what is good. And he calls it the good news, what we often call the gospel. And, and Paul really seeks to condense this understanding into probably what was very early on the initial creeds of the church probably recited quite frequently as they would gather that Christ died, that Christ was buried, that Christ rose again. And all of this happened according to scripture. Paul will, will rely upon the authority of scripture, the stories and the promises made by God generation after generation to the people of God. But, but Paul doesn't just assert the authority of scripture in, in proclaiming this good news that Christ has come uh, and in Christ's death and resurrection has now awoken this new life of salvation to the people. He also appeals to Peter and to the Jerusalem church at large. And he even says, I myself have come to experience this reality of resurrection in a way that should give you some understanding of what it looks like when a people come to be changed by this good news. And, and what we'll find in this chapter, especially how the resurrection is central to Paul's understanding of the ethics of the church that what they believe about the resurrection will change how they behave with one another and with the wider world outside. Now, I, I want us to be clear that the cross itself isn't bad news, even though it's obviously a story about death and betrayal and shame and suffering. But often what we find, I, I think, a lot in our churches uh, and in our preaching and in our understanding of our Christian faith is that the cross plays an outsized role in the story. And what we often would associate with, I guess, traditional Christian preaching or theology is stories that center on things like sin and guilt and shame. Uh, sort of this idea that as we see the cross, that God is pointing down and, and accusing the rest of humanity, look what you made me do. Um, I, I think that, that by, by focusing all of our attention on the story of the cross and leaving out the story of the resurrection, we really forget the role that new life plays within our story, how the world is transformed away from death, away from shame and guilt and sin, and into promise, hope, life, and love. And that's what Paul is trying to, to help the Corinthians land on, and I, I think help us too, is that the way Paul will tell the story is that grace had to work overtime in him. He, he was just a mess when it came to all the other, the, the apostles. And if we read the stories of these other apostles, well, they were a bit of a mess too. Peter especially would be argumentative and loud and, and basically put his foot in his mouth way too many times. And Paul would say, listen, as, as far as I'm concerned, Peter's a saint compared to me because Paul had been instrumental in the persecution of the church and in the martyrdom of some of its leaders. He had been religious, devout even, committed to the faith and yet missed the point entirely until he came to a turning point. And in fact, that turning point was so profound that when he encountered Jesus, Paul changed his name. It was originally Saul, named after that king who uh, was such a thorn in David's side for so long. Paul finds himself needing to rename himself, that, that he has had such a powerful transformation that he has come to now completely re-understand who he is, who the world is, and God's role within those stories. Now, now most of the time, I, I think that it's really that it's, it's bad news that changes our world. We can think of the, the death of a loved one or, or a, an illness that strikes us or... Uh, how we lose our job or, or something like that, that, that really seems to be such a profound setback that it changes the course of our life. I know I'll even tell the story about how my parents' divorce set me down a path that, that has led to a lot of hurt and heartache and, and a lot of my own issues that keep coming up in my life because of what happened way back then. It was that bad news that seemed to have this life-changing effect on me. For us, a lot of times the good news that we experience is more subtle. You know, we have kids and promotions and, and something good that comes our way, but rarely do we see in the moment how life-changing it can be. 
once we get a little further down the road, we can look back and see that realization that our kids profoundly change our life or this new job or this new place to live or whatever. But, but often it's in the moment where we experience bad news that it is easily understood to be life-changing. Paul is trying to help the Corinthians who have gone down the road a bit, look back and see how the resurrection has become their foundation and their salvation, and that they can rely on its life-changing reality of good news to actually realign themselves to where they want to be. As far as Paul is concerned, everything flows from the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And in this resurrection, what he finds is that the, the resurrection itself becomes the lens by which we interpret the world, by which we see and make sense of everything that's happening, as well as our role to act within it. And how we see the resurrection impacts how we see who God is, who the world is, our place within that world. And so we can ask ourselves, do we, do we view God as a distant God? Or is God present with us? I think the resurrection helps us to answer that question. That if God is not alive anymore, then it's fine that God's distant and way off there. Is, is God capricious, acting in God's own whims and whimsy and something that we can't understand? Or, or is God gracious to us? Does God know us? Is God unconcerned and detached? Or is God engaged with the ways of this world? Is God welcoming to all or is God restrictive of who is in and who is out? You see, Paul will explain to the Corinthians that how they act gives him some insight into where they may have missed the point of everything he taught them, like he once did. Because Paul will admit that I once missed the point. I once completely misunderstood God's direction and purpose within this world. He says, I was like a premature baby uh, born out of time, too frail to make it in this world, but God enlivened me. And, and he, he's explaining how it's this miracle of life that he's now experienced through the resurrection of Christ that he understands just how close he was to death. Not physical death per se, but, but a, a life that has grown so closed off and restrictive, judgmental and harsh, that you're drawn away from the true purpose by which you've been made. Paul's saying this church in Corinth has become just like that, that they are close to death and they don't even know it. But if they look around, they can see the signs of that death and instead, what they need to do is look and see where the signs of life are longing to come and make itself known. Uh, often, whenever we experience the sense of frailty or threat, our, our gut instinct is to protect ourselves. When we feel the loss of, of a loved one or, or the threat of our own health, we want to just close up and, and keep ourselves inside. But, but I think that also there's this moment when, when we experience those things that it can give us compassion for other people, maybe for people who are in very different realities than us, but, but we know what it's like to, to, to long for someone that we will never see again, at least in this life. We know what it's like to fear for the loss of those that we love when they have a serious illness. And I think that, that one of the gifts that we have, that, that Paul is trying to introduce to the Corinthians, certainly, is, is how we can find compassion for one another when we are willing to experience their story and their reality and see how they have come to find life and hope within this world. You know, there's, there's this conversation right now in, in our world about the restricting books that may be tough for kids to be exposed to, some stories and realities of the world that we would honestly want to protect our kids from, especially because they've experienced so much frailty and death and illness over the past couple of years. And so why would we want them to read stories about, uh, you know, the Holocaust or, or uh, suffering within the black community? Shouldn't we try to protect them and keep their innocence together for just a little bit longer? But I know that, that, for example, whenever I was made to read I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings in high school, it was such a different reality than what I'd been exposed to that it opened my eyes to the hurt and the pain that exists in this world. And, and I, I think it built in me a greater sense of compassion, not a greater sense of fear. We, we often go through these traumatic experiences and have an opportunity to embrace a compassionate and empathetic response 
And that, I think, is the power of new life in God. That we are called to experience the cross of Christ, death and sacrifice and suffering, so that we might know what new life and promise and hope can be. And, and Paul will say that, that his primary witness of understanding this is that it happened to him, that, that life came to him unbidden. He wasn't looking for a religious experience. He wasn't looking for even salvation or for Jesus, but life came to him and could not be stopped. Uh, like they say in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. And, and what we are called to be in the church is people who will embody that life who will live in the truth and reality of the death and resurrection of Christ. And within that story, find our own death, our own ways of living that draw life out of this world, and then see how the Spirit of God comes to us and calls us back to a new life filled with good news so that we might be messengers of that good news, proclaimers of that story, those who would testify to our own experience that also happened according to the scriptures. We experience this embodied life whenever we partake in baptism services, whenever we are buried and raised again to new life, whenever we take communion. It's the core elements of who we are that help us to tell this story. And so that when we gather around the table at communion, we are retelling the story of Jesus's death, primarily of Jesus's death. But you see, Paul ends in his teaching to the Corinthians about what communion means is that we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns, that we anticipate that that death is not the final story. And so as we prepare to partake these elements today, I want us to consider how this story is as much about resurrection as it is about the cross. That when we partake the elements of Jesus's body and blood, when we welcome that to ourselves, we are also welcoming the life that that body and blood enlivens. And so, as we consider the gathering of this table, I want us to see the life that is represented around the table. Those who find themselves may be surprised to be there, that they consider themselves unwelcomed, unwanted there, and yet God has made a place for them. God has made a place for you. And so the, on the evening of his death, Jesus gathered his friends close to him, and he explained to them the meaning of his death in this very familiar experience that they would have. And particularly, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. And he explained how that bread was his body, blessed and broken and offered to the world, that those who would take and eat of it might find themselves enlivened, nourished, enriched, sustained, made healthy and whole. And so when we take and eat, we remember the brokenness of the body, but we also remember how that brokenness leads to healing. And so I invite you to take and eat and remember that story. In the same way after the meal, Jesus passes a cup, representative of a offering made centuries before to see the people rescued from slavery and into their own land filled with promise. And so too, Jesus will say that this cup is, is poured out as an offering of covenant, of promise, a way to seal ourselves together as God once sealed God's self to the people of Israel. Here we are sealed in Jesus's blood in a life that is willing to be laid down so that new life might come. And so as we partake of this, what we are partaking of is the promise of forgiveness, of being made whole, of being restored back to the fullness of life that God promises. And we are empowered by this because it is Jesus's very life that is gifted to us. And so once more, we find this cup around the table, filled to the brim with the life that God promises. And so take and drink and remember this good news. And like I said before, Paul encouraged the people to remember that every time they would partake of this meal and drink from this cup, they proclaim the Lord's death until he arrives back into the fullness of our presence. 
And we may find that within our gathering, we already sense how the Spirit is with us. The enlivening reality of God's presence that equips us to have greater compassion and empathy for those who God has surrounded us with. And so I would pray that we would be a people who senses our call to empathy, our call to a life that embodies the good news in a way that we might be vessels that would testify to the power of God in our life. May we sense as we look back along the road we have traveled, the ways that God has led us, restored us, saved us, set our feet firmly upon this story of good news so that we might be a people filled with life. I hope you experience that life this week. Amen. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way to my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are, I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you tire me when I'm calling, Lord you hear me when
anything, I hope that we would find how the resurrection of life within this world overcomes the gloom and despair that death can bring. And instead of finding ourselves trapped in the feelings of insecurity that often the threats of this world bring, we are moved forward to bring the life and love, the hope and promise that God has called us to. That by knowing of God's salvation, we might be bearers of that message to others. Amen.